Very, very good evening uh, to everyone who is joining us uh, in this Zoom session. We're at Dear Doctor Session 3 and to all, um, everyone is tuning in on Facebook Live as well. Uh, my name is Jean and I'm from the Early Childhood Development team at Lian Foundation and we're really, really excited today to be having uh, a very, very interesting group of professionals from the Child Development Unit at NUH. So guys, we are in what, week 8 of the Circuit Breaker and I think no matter uh, how old you are, um, what sort of job you're in, uh, we must be feeling a bit tired uh, as of now. And so today's topic really is very, very apt. We are talking about um, self-care, self-care for caregivers. And I think um, it's a very, very interesting uh, way of thinking how we can reframe uh, the stress that we are facing. So um, today's session, uh, just to share a bit, is brought to you by the Lian Foundation, uh, the Child Development Unit at uh, National University Hospital, as well as our partners, uh, SG Enable and Superhero Me. And I think uh, just to quickly introduce our speakers, tonight we have uh, Dr. Chong Shang Chi, Head and Senior Consultant, Ms. Elizabeth Reagan, Senior Psychologist, uh, Ms. Pang Li Yen, Senior Medical Social Worker from the CDU at NUH. And a quick disclaimer that whatever we're sharing really is not, um, if you need help, go and see a doctor, go and see a professional. Uh, the purpose of tonight's discussion uh, is for education and to really improve our collective community knowledge so that we can better empower ourselves during this time of crisis. So um, I guess without further ado, um, over to you, uh, Dr. Chong, uh, for the first part of uh, our discussion. Yes. Thank you for the introduction, Jean. Hello, mummies, daddies, caregivers, all of you staying at home. We are actually on 30, uh, 52, the 52nd day of circuit breaker. And I would like to say well done to all of you. Now, I know this is a period where a lot of you have been pushing yourselves very hard. And you know, in the clinics and recently when we've been calling parents, we actually see that the parents are really trying to do the very best, okay? And um, a lot of parents will be asking, how do I do more? How do I set up routines? How do I manage these behaviors? And one thing I'd like to ask the parents is how have you been looking after yourself? And sometimes I don't really get an answer, which, is, which just means actually a lot of times I think the parents have not been really looking after themselves actually. So today's talk is about you, it is for you. And we're gonna teach you how to stay positive and to build positive relationships. I hope today's lecture will carry us even beyond the COVID pandemic period, yeah? Okay, I want you to take a look at this picture. What do you see? This is a picture of a mobile, okay? Uh, pick any one of the family members you see there. You could be the mummy, the daddy. Uh, you know, so when we are the mummy and daddy, think about the whole family as a system. So when you have a mobile, you pull one of the characters, what happens? The whole thing shakes, right? So what happens to you emotionally does have an effect on the people around you and the children that you try to take a uh, look after. So if you have positive emotions, then usually you can build positive relationships. And then some parents see themselves as the whole soul person, uh, you know, holding the mobile together. So if it breaks, then the whole thing just falls apart. And you just feel very stressed about it because then you feel guilty and then you start to feel like, oh, I've done, not done well and the family is just not holding together. So for a start, let's look at today's case study. I want to share a few things with you. So this is Madam Mary. She and her husband are in essential service. Okay, so the husband works as a taxi driver, so he works very long hours. And the mother, Madam Mary, actually works as a hospital patient so service associate. So she works rather long hours too. So before circuit breaker, Daniel and Adam are two of her children with special needs. Daniel is six, Adam is three. They go to early intervention service. After school, they will go to childcare and sometimes they're looked after by grandma. And because of circuit breaker, they were advised not to drop the kids off at the grandparents' home. So the grandma has moved in to stay with them. Okay, so it's a huge adjustment for the grandmother also. And then there is another child who is Rachel and she is four. So next slide. Let's look at what's happening to Madam Mary during COVID-19 circuit breaker time. Okay, she says that Daniel isn't doing well with home-based learning. 
this is because the grandma is really not able to teach uh, him very well. And he is very challenging because he's not adjusting well to, to this uh, circuit breaker. And so he cries a lot. He wants to go up. Then Adam, he's three, he's very young, and he's got global delay. So he actually needs a lot of help for everything. So caregiving needs is very high for these two children. So on top of two out of three special needs children who need to be looked after, she has she's very stressed out uh, by her work, her chores, her duties. And then there are changes in the routine childcare arrangements, and she has to tell grandma how to look after. And grandma is elderly, so it's not very easy for her. And then she's trying to keep their jobs because you know a lot of people have lost their jobs so she's working very hard and she's trying to keep the finances in the home very healthy okay and in this whole process the relationships are sometimes uh, a little bit stressed and uh, not very harmonious so how do we think madam mary feels right so in the Straits time just three days ago there was a feature about special needs children during circuit breaker one of the mothers said she was so afraid to start the day Okay, some of you are overwhelmed, very frustrated, don't know what to do. Some of you feel very guilty because you didn't do the goals of the HBL well. And then you're starting to have caregiver burn, uh, burn out. And then when you're working, you're not focusing because you're worried about your children, okay? So I, I liken this to pushing the NTUC supermarket trolley, right? Usually when we go to NTUC, it's not like circuit breaker. During circuit breaker, we put a lot of things inside, our toilet paper, our oil, our cooking oil, the things that we need. And you know, I think this is an extraordinary time. And normally, your trolley is very full. And now you have extra duties, extra uh, you know, responsibilities. On top of that, a very heavy heart. So it's become a very heavy cut to push. And over the days, you find yourself burning out, really. Okay, so the next time. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about positive emotions and positive relationships. So we explain why these two come together. So I'm going to mention a little bit about how to build positive relationships, and then we'll touch more on positive emotions. Why do we need positive relationships at home? Because the research on resilience shows that if you have positive relationships, harmonious relationships, be it at home, at work, it's actually protective against stress, right? Positive relationships are absolutely necessary for children to learn because they are not anxious, they are not afraid. So a lot of times the caregiver will look after everything about the child. But the caregiver does not realize that it is as important her own needs. So if you take an aeroplane, what does the air stewardess tell you to do? She will tell you, you have to put on, if you know there's something wrong with the plane, you have to quickly put on your own oxygen mask. You have to put on your safety life jacket first. Then you look after your children. So if you are not safe, if you are not positive, if you are not looked after, nobody can look after the child well. Okay, so next slide. Right, so... Um, we have developed infographics about how to build positive relationships. And because of time, I cannot cover everything. The next slide will tell you some of the things I want to um, kind of like share with parents, okay? So a lot of times parents will tell me, my child refuses to listen to me. Everything I want the child to do, he's not listening, okay? So there is a small difference between getting a child to comply versus getting a child to cooperate. What is the difference? Compliance means that I want a child to do something. I hope he will do what I want him to do. Cooperation means that you balance what you think the child may want to do, some boundaries, some choices with some expectations. So you actually see that one is very adult pushed down. The other one tries to get the child to work with you. All right. So in terms of the mindset, we need to change the behavior. So there's an unequal power distribution here. The father or the mother is really the adult authority. She's in power. The child has no choice and no control. Sometimes if you give children a little bit of power, a little bit of choice, a little bit of control, they actually like it. They will start to say, oh, I get to choose what I want. Oh, oh, mommy is asking me to, to help out. And she feels that she's important. And she will start to try to follow you, cooperate with you. The language is also very important. Instead of yelling, scolding, um, you know, um, and, and you say, you know, you're very, very bad and you're a naughty boy. Um, you know, sometimes we switch around and we just say, can you please help me? Mommy needs your help. You are mommy's good little helper. The children will do well if they can. And sometimes if you change some of these things, the children will start to cooperate with you. Okay, another thing we, the next slide, another thing we find commonly is that 
we expect all our children to be the same. Actually, they really are not. So I know circuit breaker, we say, oh, we have to do the routines. Um, some of kids have challenging behaviours and this is what we suggest we can do. But no child is actually the same. So among these three children Madam Mary has, I want you to think, take a look. What do you think Daniel, Rachel, or Adam are different in? So Adam is very exuberant, active. Daniel is, has autism, so he's, he needs structured routines. Rachel is very quiet, shy, but she's very adaptable. So who do we think does better in routines? Probably Daniel, right? But who adjusts better for this circuit breaker time? It'd probably be Rachel, okay? And then who needs the very high activity type, uh, high motion type activities, you know, movement, needs a lot of movement breaks? That would be probably Adam, okay? But then also who may feel neglected is probably Rachel, okay? So I know it's probably a lot. The parents say, huh, I have so much to do. Now I have to cater what I need for every child. Um, it's not really like that. It is when you find specific things very challenging to work with particular children. Think about whether or not what you do suits them and suits their temperament. So it's a little bit like this picture I want to show you. This next one shows you a child putting on shoes. You have to adjust to the fit of the child. The child keeps wearing shoes that do not fit him. Slowly the feet hurt and they're carelesses. And you cannot build a positive relationship like that, okay? Right. So now, next, we want to focus on your emotions. Okay. Now, this will take a large part of the lecture. Uh, research on positive psychology uh, helps us to understand resilience. And uh, one of the uh, people and the doctors and psychiatrists doing this is Dr. Martin Seligman. Also, oh, positive psychology is really the science behind building well uh, being, confidence, and hope through positive experiences and positive states and traits, okay? I want to share with you four or five did you know things about positive psychology, okay? Did you know the first one? If you try to be happy, you try to put on a happy face, that will not lift your mood. But did you know that if you exercise and you exercise your brain to stay positive, we call positive mood habits, these things actually help to lift your mood. So you must put in a bit of effort and labor. You must be aware that this must be done. So for example, next slide, what can Madam Mary do? Every day she needs to try to get enough sleep, try to eat well, and try. I know a lot of us can't do this exercise. Sleep, I find, is very, very important. I think a lot of mothers are sleep deprived, fathers are sleep deprived. That affects mood, okay? But every day she should also like she brushes her teeth, spend five to 10 minutes in emotional labor, time invested in some good emotional habits. We'll teach you that later. Okay, next slide. The second, did you know, is gratitude is actually very powerful. All right. So what does that mean? How, how do we be grateful? How can I be grateful, right? There are so many bad things happening. The so next slide shows you. For example, what can Madam Mary do? What can she be grateful for? Ah, Maybe she said, wow, I actually have, still have a job. I'm so thankful the grandma can help me. I'm so grateful the children are safe. You know, and some of you say, oh yeah, I, I think, you know, I know I don't have bubble tea, but at least I can go to NTUC, right? So everything that you can find gratitude in, celebrate that. And you know, some children in school, when the teachers teach them about uh, positive psychology, they are actually made to do a gratitude journal. What are you grateful for? My kids actually do that in school, you know. I'm grateful for my parents, I'm grateful for my friends, I'm grateful for this and that. So use grateful language every day when you do a bit of self-talk, okay? Now, the next thing, did you know? The next one is finding meaning in what you do is very important, okay? And what does this mean for Madam Mary, okay? So a lot of caregivers tell me like this, Dr. Chong, I'm doing everything I can. Sometimes my family doesn't appreciate me. I think my children don't appreciate me. So this is what happens. Whether we find meaning in our role is not contingent about how people respond, how your child does. The, the whole act of caregiving is so big in meaning itself. Meaning means the bigger role, your mission, okay? So you, for example, she could think, I am very important to my children. This is the meaning uh, of what I'm doing. I'm so important to my colleagues at workplace. What about everybody staying at home? So miserable. But the greater meaning of this is we are trying to protect 
our country, we are trying to protect the public, right? So safe focus on small achievable, achievable goals. And this actually helps you remember why you plow every day, why sometimes things are hard, because there's meaning in what you do. Okay, the last, did you know is, did you know that giving rather than taking actually gives much joy? But I know a lot of you give and give and give until you feel like you have nothing left to give. So the next slide tells you, Dr. Martin Seligman has a very, very important message here for caregivers. She, he actually says that worry, stress and anxiety are likely experienced by people whose lives are high in meaningfulness but low in happiness. Can you imagine that? He is saying that because you give so much, you are more likely to experience this. But this is not bad because this is because your caregiving is very meaningful. So do not over worry if sometimes you feel like you have negative emotions because you probably are very invested in the meaning of your caregiving. And it is exhausting, okay? But there is a lot of purpose in what you do. So I really need you to remember that. And it's not wrong to have negative feelings sometimes, but it is very important. So the next slide shows you, if you are a mummy, remember your cup. Is your cup full or empty? And you must be aware. So I also drew here the beer marks for the fathers, okay? So an important part of psychological resilience is sometimes when our cups are already drained, we don't even know. We don't know how to top it up. So your energy levels are low. You need to push it up, fill your cup, and then you would start to realize that things may go a bit better and the perspective is important, okay? So Elizabeth and I are going to teach you a few things you can do to think to, uh, to help yourself rethink your challenges. Okay, next slide. The first thing I wanna teach you is self-compassion. What is self-compassion? So if you have a friend who is feeling down, do you scold the friend? Do you say nasty things to your friend? You don't. What do you do? You encourage, you tell the friend nice things and you tell the friend kind things. So the next, time, the next slide shows you this picture of a person coming out from the mirror to hug yourself. So I think a lot of Asian people are not used to that. They are just saying that, you know, I need to do better. They are very critical of themselves. A lot of mothers, fathers feel they are not doing good enough. But we should change it around, okay? That means that be kind to yourself. Don't be overcritical. It's okay if you're not perfect. We are doing the best we can. And it's certainly not a perfect time. So you do not need to be perfect either. This is your inner guiding voice. So I want to tell you that a lot of people think self-compassion, next slide, is it's a weakness, you know, and it's not. It's not the same as poor self-esteem. It is not like that. So self-esteem is how we see ourselves, but self-compassion, how we treat ourselves. And then, you know, self-compassion, you do not need to hide your personal shortcomings. Uh, you tell yourself you do not need to be perfect. So I have here some resources, which they will put on the slides for you. And there are books that can teach you how to marry even a bit of mindfulness with self-compassion. And there is uh, actually a center for self-compassion uh, organization that you can go to to look at uh, some of the resources. So I will pass you over to uh, Elizabeth now, who is going to teach you some more about reframing some of your challenges. So over to you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Dr. Chong. Hi, everyone. Uh, well, this has been an especially stressful period for many, and we are facing a situation that's really beyond our control. We've never faced anything like this before. Much like COVID-19 and the accompanying changes, on a daily basis, many of the situations we face are actually beyond our control. But it often seems that we behave in a certain way because of the situation. So it basically seems like the situation is to blame for our responses. But actually, while situations are beyond our control, how we react or respond to these situations is these situations is actually something we have some control over. And that's where this term cognitive reframing comes in. So what actually is cognitive reframing? That's the next slide. Simply put, as you look at this slide, it is changing the way we think about a situation by looking at it through different lenses. Now, you may be asking, why do I need to change my thoughts since it's usually my feelings and reactions that affect me? Well, actually, if you take a look at the triangle on the slide, our thoughts affect our feelings and responses. The thing is, though, very often our thoughts about situations are automatic 
and we are often not aware of them. We also usually have negative thought patterns or what we call cognitive distortions, and we tend to use these quite automatically to view the situations that we encounter. Now, there are at least 10 uh, cognitive distortions or more if you look online, um, but I'm just going to go over some of them today. Before we do that, on the next slide, we'll look at Madam Mary's thoughts and feelings about her situation. Earlier, Dr. Chong um, shared a little bit about Madam Mary's situation, and some of the things that come up are feelings of guilt because she's not able to complete her children's HBL every day. You know, when her children fight, she feels the, the neighbors will be thinking something about her. Or uh, on the next slide, you'll see she's feeling overwhelmed and exhausted. Uh, she loses her temper, but she feels that she needs to keep everything together and she needs to be quite zen throughout, right? And then uh, again on the uh, next slide, you know, she's saying one of her children is uh, starting to feel sick. And again, that's something that worries her. So there's so many thoughts and feelings that are going through her mind and that she's experiencing. And let's just take a look at some of the cognitive distortions that these thoughts fall under. Okay, the first one is black and white thinking. And this one might sound familiar to you because basically it means we can be quite extreme in how we perceive situations. It's all or nothing. It's an A or a complete failure. We tend to dismiss the middle ground. So often what we unconsciously are believing or saying to ourselves is there is no room for errors, there's no room for imperfections. If we were to look at one of the thoughts that Madam Mary had, you know, she said, I'm not able to complete the HBL with all my children every day. And therefore, she felt like she had failed. This thought of being a failure has actually led to her feeling guilty. Now think about it. She has three children with HBL demands daily for a number of weeks. And that's a very high expectation of herself. And when she doesn't complete it, she feels she has failed, right? On the next slide, the next cognitive distortion that we talk about uh, is also something that many of us may use, and it's the mental filter. How I'd like you to think of it is basically like a torchlight. A torchlight focuses on one area or aspect and illuminates only that area. Similarly, very often, people who tend to use the mental filter tend to focus only on the negative aspects and filter out the positive ones. So for example, if someone didn't agree with me today, I might focus only on that. When actually that was only a small portion of my day and there were so many other more positive things that could have happened. And how does that make us feel? Generally not great, right? Does it help us to change the situation? No, not if we keep focusing only on the negative. So in Madam Mary's case, when her children argue, which may not be all the time, she tends to focus on those particular situations and she keeps on thinking about what her neighbors might be thinking about her. And I think that's not an unusual thing for most parents or even most individuals to ruminate on certain things that happen. But what's more important is to be aware that thinking like this all the time can affect us negatively rather than changing anything about our situation. Another cognitive distortion is jumping to conclusions. Now, I'm sure some of you are nodding your heads and feeling, yep, this is me. This thought pattern is very often negative. Most of us don't jump to positive conclusions. Instead, we tend to jump to negative conclusions, don't we? We basically expect the worst or we make negative assumptions of people and situations. Now, in Madam Mary's case, she's assuming that her child is misbehaving because he is trying to annoy her. Why is it called jumping to conclusions? Because we are reaching a conclusion or making an assumption based on very little information. Now, another example that we face in our daily lives is sometimes when a spouse or even a colleague says or does something uh, to us or, or responds to us in a certain way, we take it to be meant in a bad way against us. We jump to a conclusion. Another common cognitive distortion is one where we put unreasonable demands on ourselves. We do this by using should, must, have to, never, always, or such statements. I'm sure if you think about it today, you've used some of these statements a few times. Now, what these statements do is they place an unreasonable or unattainable
double standard or expectation on ourselves and others. And if we don't do these statements, we have failed. For example, when Madam Mary says that she should be able to juggle all her duties in a certain way, and she doesn't do them in that way, she feels guilty and she feels like a failure, right? So her expectation was really high for a lot of things, and there is again no room for failure or no room uh, for adjustment. And unconsciously, a lot of us use these words and we are actually feeding these messages to ourselves. The final cognitive distortion that I want to introduce to you is personalization or blame, which means blaming ourselves or someone else for situations that are usually beyond our control. In addition, in many of these situations, there are likely to also be other contributing factors. Not just one person or one factor is responsible for the situation. So for example, Madam Mary blames herself when her child is unwell, but it isn't really within her control and there could be other things that have caused the child to feel unwell. Okay, now on the next slide, I must say that it is common for us to have certain thoughts like I've described. And some of these negative thoughts might actually be true about the situation. But what's important to remember is they are not the only truth or reality in our situations. And unfortunately, we tend to fixate only on those things rather than on other realities that might be true in our situation. Now, when we view things through these negative lenses all the time or focus only on these negative thoughts all the time, they will affect how we feel and respond. And what we want to do is we want to try to take control and have more positive experiences in our situation. So then how can we change our negative thoughts? One of the ways to do this is to try using different lenses to view situations or people. I'm going to go over some of these lenses. The first one is the wide lens. Okay. Now, for this one, instead of just focusing on the situation or on one aspect of the situation that made you feel upset, zoom out like a camera. Focus on other aspects of the situation, such as the positives or things that did go right in that situation. So you can try to reflect on what you can learn from the situation instead of what went wrong. Now on the next slide, I'll talk about a couple of questions that you could ask yourself to help you zoom out and use the white lens. The first one is, what can I learn from this situation? So there's usually some learning point there. Another question is, what else happen, happened today that I can be grateful for? The attitude of gratitude, which Dr. Chong mentioned earlier, is one way of zooming out. What else turned out to be positive? Or what have I learned about my child or family members through these situations? For example, Madam Mary may be able to reflect that she has learned to help her children to complete one activity. A parent that we spoke to recently shared that although it was hard when her child had meltdowns during this period, she learned that her child actually responds to certain routines and that he has learned certain skills to calm himself down. And she did not know that before because he was usually in school or childcare. And such things can be very encouraging on your journey. And it's something you can learn even through a negative situation. The next lens, is the alternative lens, which is basically for us to adopt an alternative perspective. Some questions to ask ourselves are, what would my friend say to me about this situation? Now, this is a very helpful uh, question for us to ask because very often it is hard for us to step back, but someone who is not in the situation can provide a different perspective. Another question we can ask, is what would I tell my friend if he or she was in the same position? This is also helpful because very often we are harder on ourselves than we are on others who are in the same situation. So ask yourself, if the negative things that you are saying to yourself are things that you would say to your friend in the same situation, or even things that you would say to your child, and then ask yourself, that same advice that you would give to your friend, why wouldn't you take it? you are as deserving as someone else of that self-compassion. For example, a friend might tell Madam Mary, you are so stretched with so many demands, yet you manage to help your children with some of their work, as well as do your own work and chores. Or when your child coughed, 
it may be just a common flu or an allergic reaction. It's not dismissing your concerns, but considering another perspective. And the final lens is the long lens. Think about how you would look back at the situation. If you think about something that worried you or upset you in the past, you might realize that now when you look back on it, it wasn't so important or you can't even remember what bothered you about that situation. Some questions you can ask yourself is, how would I view this situation in a week, a month, or even a year? Or how would I view this situation after the circuit breaker? So to sum it up, cognitive reframing is not about brainwashing yourself or making up fake positive thoughts. I've heard people ask me this. But it's actually about finding alternative, realistic thoughts about our situations. Because sometimes, if you stop and think about it, even our negative thoughts are not realistic. Somehow though, we are more easily able to accept them than to accept other neutral or positive thoughts. So basically what we want to do is reflect on our thoughts and find other realities in the situation that we're facing. I'll pass the time back to Dr. Chong. Thank you, Elizabeth. All right, so it's time to sum up today's uh, talk. And I think you've heard a lot. I will make this available on the slide. Uh, on the, yeah, the slides will be made available on the website. And I just want to say that um, I think it's not a very common habit that parents take some time to do a little bit of this, uh, you know, these mindful habits or these mood exercises. But I hope that from today onwards, you will be conscious that these are actually essential skills for you to look after yourself as a caregiver. So we hope that we've given you tools in your toolkit. You must fill your cup up regularly when it starts to be empty because a lot of people don't even realize that it's empty already, right? Focus on what you can change, then what you cannot change, okay? And I think you really need to practice some of these things that we teach you so that we can continue to stay positive and build positive relationships at home. Okay, my last slide is also to teach parents you must know when to seek help, okay? Because during COVID, and I think this pandemic is going to be around for a while, and with the financial repercussions, people losing jobs, you know, there is a huge impact in our country, on the mental health of our people, and we recognize that. The second thing is in the papers, you realize that there is already a rise in domestic abuse cases because it's a very stressful situation where families that sometimes cannot get along are squeezed into a very small household. So if you have unmanageable emotions, very significant anxiety or depression, or you are a victim of abuse, uh, please do seek professional help. All right. Okay. And with that, I would like to uh, pass the time back to Jean. Thank you very much, uh, Shang-Chi and Elizabeth for the sharing. So parents uh, and caregivers, anyone actually, uh, we have developed a set of COVID-19 resources available um, at the NUH website. Uh, these resources will also be emailed out to participants uh, along with the slides after today's sharing. So, you know, print out these resources, stick it on your fridge. Uh, sometimes we all just need a little bit of reminder about the fact that we are not alone on this journey. Um, and uh, before we jump into the Q&A, um, just like to uh, get a bit of your help. If you are a caregiver of a child uh, with developmental disabilities, we're looking for volunteers to take part in this survey. So if you have your phone, uh, please scan the QR code there, or if not, we will uh, put up a link to this form uh, with the Facebook Live video. We need your help to share your caregiving experiences uh, during this COVID-19 pandemic uh, in the hope that this will help shape future management principles. And if you're a service provider um, to children with developmental disabilities, there is another uh, survey for you. Uh, next slide, please. Another survey for you to fill in. Uh, and this again will help, um, I think, the sector in Singapore really think how we can better meet the needs of families that we serve. Okay, wonderful. And I think with that, let's move on to um, the second part of our discussion. So parents, I think we had close to 190 parents writing in over the, the last few weeks, signing up for this Dear Doctor series. And one of the key points about this is really um, getting your questions out to the professionals. So um, in today's theme on self-care for caregivers, we have picked out 
uh, five themes on caregiving, um, on self-care, on struggles that are commonly faced by the parents of children with special needs uh, that the team from CDU will answer this evening. So let's kick start uh, the Q&A session with the first question. Uh, the theme of this question is really on the lack of family support. Uh, Judy, uh, she is a mummy of a six-year-old with uh, autism. She wrote in no me time to breathe. Family not supportive. Still living with in-laws. So it is really, really difficult every day. So I think um, let's maybe invite Li Yen mm. to share with us some thoughts on how parents like Judy can cope. Yeah, okay. Thank you for the question, uh, Judy. Um, and I'm really hearing the frustration about not feeling supported in the family. And I guess it can be really especially hard uh, because we tend to have different expectations uh, from our own family members. Um, and I guess that this sense of not feeling supported can also reinforce the fatigue uh, that parents are already feeling like uh, no time to breathe and there's still no support. Yeah, so I, I guess as we think about how we can um, uh, try to get more family support, um, there also isn't like a one size fits all kind of solution because um, every family culture, every family dynamics are also very different. Uh, but perhaps we can consider a few factors that might be able to help us look at this issue. I think firstly, it's probably helpful to take a step back and acknowledge that family members may also take time to process their feelings. I think we are, the parents are also needing time to process their own feelings, as well as um, acknowledging that they probably could be at a loss on how to offer support. So it also depends on how the lack of uh, support uh, looks like. Um, so I commonly hear uh, two main things from parents when they feel unsupported in the family. I think the first thing is that uh, they find that uh, the family members are not being supportive because they are uninvolved. And the other scenario could also be a case of feeling that they are trying to be too involved. And a lot of the comments that they are hearing are not, uh, are not helpful. So I guess in the first scenario, when they find that uh, family members are not very involved, um, whether we can consider the possibility that uh, they might want to really help, but they are not very sure how to manage or what to say or what to do. And in these cases, uh, whether it is possible for us to find opportunities uh, you know, to share resources or knowledge about the child's needs with them so that they can better understand how they can support in the family or at the very least probably um, have a greater appreci uh, appreciation for where the parents are coming from. And the other situation, uh, you know, where parents feel unsupported when they find that uh, the other family members may come across as being um, crossing boundaries or being overly involved, um, they may also like to consider these two things. I think firstly is to try to communicate with the family members when everyone is calmer. I know it's always easier said than done, <laughs> but it's always easier to communicate when everyone is feeling calmer. Yeah. So um, I think the concern to try to discuss would be about the child's interest and to discuss what might be some boundaries that everyone can try to play a part in so as to support the child's interest. So it doesn't become like, a, I'm frustrated with you, can you please stop doing this? You know, but it's really the child's interest being the center of you know, everybody's concern and understanding and respecting what everyone is trying to do. Um, I guess when we think about the idea of boundaries, it is really not to create distance. But when we have healthy boundaries um, in the family, it can support relationships, actually. Yeah. So next, uh, it is also possible to uh, and meaningful, I, I think, to consider opportunities um, to affirm the other family members' uh, involvement and try to play to their strengths. You know, so, so find opportunities to appreciate the other family members. So like, for example, uh, appreciating grandma's cooking, you know, like, wow, the kids love your cooking, that kind of thing. So I think I'm bringing that up because with some families, you are seeing that there are grandparents who very much love to be involved. But when they find that hey, the parents don't seem to want them to be involved and they can react by trying harder to be involved. And over time, you know, we see that this can become a repeated pattern, you know, where the grandparents and the parents become very frustrated with each other. And over time, you know, they just feel more and more unsupported because they don't feel understood uh, what each other is trying to do. Yeah, so uh, I'm bringing this up because uh, I think when we suggest how we can find ways to affirm and appreciate and show gratitude, I think um, these are little ways in which we are helping everyone to hopefully take a little step back. 
you know so we may think that hey, showing appreciation might be a very very small thing um, but I would like to bring back, you know, the image of the mobile of the family relationships that Dr. Chong uh, showed earlier, that when we work on one part of a relationship in the family, it can have a ripple effect on the other parts of the system of relationships in the family. So, for example, what I'm trying to share is that in this um, uh, example, you know, when there is lesser tension between the parent and the grandparent, it can have an effect on the relationship between the parents and that can also have an effect on how they are managing the parent-child uh, relationship. Uh, but of course, having said that, uh, I also um, can imagine many situations where we, we don't see very easy shifts, especially when we uh, you know, live together with the extended families. We, we, we can be thankful that they all mean well, but you know, everyone also uh, brings along their own experience, their own belief, their own communication style, and just not very easy to see a shift although that is a meaningful area to work on. So what I would like to share with parents also is that it is also important to validate your own needs. Yeah. So when you find that, um, when parents find that they are not able to draw the kind of support that's helpful for them at this point in time, um, they also need to consider how to build their own uh, support system. So that support system can be from their friends, you know, from parents who have been through similar journey, from the school or whichever works for them and knowing what are the different kinds of help out there, you know, when, especially when they identify uh, um, uh, that if the situation is getting out of control and they really need to reach out for their help. So I guess on, on this, um, what, I'm also, what I'm trying to share really is that um, uh, while it is really a very difficult um, thought to, to know that, oh, you know, I'm not getting my support, whether it's possible to take a step back, uh, to think about where this might be stemming from, um, so that we can have hopefully have more helpful conversations in the family and that um, if we know that shifts are not going to take place fast and which usually doesn't you know then parents need to validate their own needs and try to build their own support system yeah I hope that attends to some of the question yeah to that question thank you thank you very thank much Lian for yeah, sharing um, mm. that um, and with that, let's move on to the second question. This is another big theme in the, uh, in the questions that we got from all of you guys. Uh, it's always about a perpetual feeling of guilt or feeling uh, inadequate. So um, Arifa, who actually wanted to ask a question live and then her son needed her, she said, when my expectations are high for my son, I always feel negative about myself whenever my efforts are ineffective. She's a mama of two boys, um, including a three-year-old with autism. So um, when we talk about guilt and feeling inadequate, maybe Elizabeth, could you share some um, perspectives of how parents can work with this? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Jean. Thank you, Arifa, for your question. I don't think this is an unusual um, concern. I think most parents and actually most individuals have this feeling of guilt and feelings of inadequacy. Let's start off with what Dr. Chong mentioned earlier about how it's so important to have self-compassion. Having self-compassion can make it a bit easier to reframe our thoughts. Now that doesn't mean it's any easier to do, but it is an important step, step to help you thrive and deal with unexpected changes on this parenting journey. When you have self-compassion, you realize how important it is for you to be okay and not just for your child to be okay and taken care of. And when you realize this, you're more likely to be open to making even small changes for yourself. So in this instance, take a moment and reflect on what is going through your mind that makes you feel that sense of guilt. What you're saying is, I'm not effective or good enough in helping my child reach certain goals. I'm not adequate um, as a mother. And if you would step back and really ask yourself whether that situation is sufficient evidence to make that conclusion, uh, you might realize that there are so many other uh, factors that contribute to you being um, a great mom for your, for your children. Okay, so first let's look at the lenses. Okay, the first lens is the white lens, right, that I want to apply to this situation. Rather than focusing on what you have not done enough of, maybe you could reflect on what you have done for your child at the end of the day. Very often, like we mentioned, we have a mental filter, that torchlight, that focuses on a few things that made us feel negative. 
when there are likely to be other more positive things that you did or that contributed to your effort to help your child reach certain goals. Take note of those, don't dismiss them. Next, you could also think about what you would like to try to do differently tomorrow or during the next time that you work with him towards his goal. Instead of focusing on what did not go well, let's flip it. If you really reflect and feel that there was something you could have handled better or some way you could have helped him reach his goal a little bit more, then instead of ruminating on what did not go right, think about what and how you could change that. Now, this must, does not dismiss that things were not great in that situation, but it helps you to focus on what you can control and it gives you a sense of hope. It also helps you to have a little bit of compassion for yourself. Mm. What you can do is you can acknowledge what went wrong or what you're not happy about and then use a coping statement. For example, we didn't get what we wanted to do done, but that's okay, we tried our best. Mm. If you think about it, no matter how much or how little effort you put in, you cannot control the results or even how another person will respond. And if your efforts or your feelings are based on how the results are or how the response is, it's going to be very hard to feel happy or satisfied. As parents, do remember that you're doing the best you can for your child, and that's really what your child needs. It's not about being perfect or doing a better job than anyone else. It's about what's good enough for your child and your family. The final lens that I want to use for this situation is the alternative lens. Again, what would you tell a friend of yours in this position? Or what do you think your friend might tell you? Would they come to the conclusion that you are ineffective, your efforts are ineffective just because of this particular situation? And another thing you mentioned was that part about high expectations. Perhaps you could work on goals that are reasonable and achievable and break them down into chunks or steps. Acknowledge your efforts and your child's efforts and acknowledge each completed step towards your goal. Together, these can help in reframing how you look at your situation and that can help you feel a bit better about yourself and your efforts. Thank you, Elizabeth, uh, for answering this question. Um, moving on to the third question, the theme that came out uh, very, very frequently was worries about the future. Um, a mom, Lisan, stay-at-home mom with a 10-year-old with ADHD, dyspraxia, and an 8-year-old boy with cerebral palsy and autism says that her self-care is non-existent. How does she not guilt trip herself and her stress, as she identified, comes from thinking about the children's future that, after all, they will never be normal. I'm just wondering if both Lian and Elizabeth would like to maybe share a word of advice with Lisan. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much, Lisan, uh, for bringing up this concern. Uh, and I, I, I can only imagine um, how much you have come, come, you've really come a very long way um, in supporting both your children. And I think sometimes it's really not easy to imagine how it must have been like for you. Um, actually, I'm hearing, we are hearing two uh, questions, two concerns in this question. Uh, so one is about the self-care. Uh, and the other part uh, is about the worries about the future. Uh, so uh, I would like to share a few thoughts uh, on the self-care and then um, Elizabeth will then attend uh, to the second concern. Yeah, so um, as I hear uh, Lee San sharing about the self-care and the guilt tree, I connect uh, with what Dr. Chong was sharing about focusing on the meaning of giving, that when parents experience the worries um, and stress of caregiving, it does say a lot about um, the sense of meaning they have, that they have in that family. Yeah, so, so I'm sure that that really applies to Lisan. Um, and very often um, I hear from parents um, who share a lot about their guilt, you know, that they, they always think that they are not a good enough, right? Not a good enough parents, not a good enough spouse, not a good enough child to their own parents. And what I really hope that these parents can also hear is also their own stories of strength that they are experiencing these challenges not because they are incompetent, but really because, um, because of how much they wish to do well by their child and how much they wish to do well by their family. I guess uh, when we think about uh, self-care, uh, again, I think we would like to start with self-compassion, really. So uh, again, we know that it's not an easy concept, uh, especially when many of us grow up with ideas that 
it's a given that as a parent, you have to sacrifice for your family, right? So, so it's not an easy idea to know, hey, how, 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 how can I suddenly, um, you know, just, just focus on taking care of myself? So I also like to introduce a different lens to, to look at this. So maybe we can consider the example where, you know, if a parent sees that, sees that the child is really tired, really stressed out, I think a lot of parents would tend to say, hey, hey, you need to take a break, take a breather right but when the child but when the parent is feeling that tired herself or himself they don't tend to say that uh, to themselves um we know that for from the child's perspective right so a lot of the child children when they learn it's not really just about what they are hearing right it's really about a lot about their lived experiences you know how they are experiencing from their significant others in the day-to-day -day lives they are really helping the child to learn and acquire um, values, you know, and, and shaping their beliefs. So when they experience from their parents how they are able to care for themselves, they are actually helping the child to learn the value of self-care, right? So how the parents can care for themselves is helping to create a very helpful script for the child to learn how to cope better, you know, as they are growing up. Um, and I guess as what uh, Elizabeth shared earlier, um, a lot of situations are often beyond our control. But how we react is probably something that we can try to have more control over. So as we think about our, our own guilt trips, you know, so can we think about how we can change the way um, that we think about a situation uh, by, by looking at, at it from the lens of the cognitive uh, reframing that Elizabeth has shared earlier, by thinking about um, how we can also try to filter the positive things that the parents are already doing instead of just focusing on the negative and thinking about uh, whether as a parent, whether we are holding ourselves responsible for every single situation in the family and whether we are placing unreasonable demands on ourselves as well. I guess these are just some um, meaningful questions we, we hope that uh, we can, um, um, we, we hope the parents can think about their own self-care. Um, so now I'll pass the time to Elizabeth on the second part of the question. Thank you, Lian, and thanks, Lisan, for your question. The second part you brought up is your worries about your children's future. You mentioned that your stress comes from thinking about the children's future. And linking back to what we mentioned earlier about how our thoughts can affect our feelings and responses, when you keep focusing your thoughts on the uncertainties of the future, they will have an impact on your feelings because you end up ruminating on those worrying thoughts. Chances are, when you think about the future, you think of many what ifs. And there are so many different possibilities that are actually very worrying and are beyond our control. However, we don't even know for sure what will or will not happen. Okay? What you can control is your present and the thoughts that you choose to focus on. First, when a new thought about the future comes to mind, what you could do is write it down. If you can think of any solution to that worry or anything that can address it, write it down and then move on. So whenever a new thought comes to your mind that is different from the previous thought, you can write it down. But if it's the same thought as before, tell yourself that you've already written it down and you can think about solutions to it when you have the time and capacity to do so. You kind of give yourself a bit of freedom to move on from the worry. If you really need to worry about it, set aside a few minutes a day to think, of, think about it and write down any new information that might help you before putting it aside again. So in this case, when you're thinking about your child's worries, if uh, about your child's future, if there's anything that can help you address that, you can write it down and see what you can address. Now, some of the words that you used also link to some thought distortions that we talked about earlier, such as the one about unreasonable expectations. There are very strong statements like the should, must, and so on statements. And these can give a sense of hopelessness there is also some personalization that you are completely responsible for their future. Now, for example, when you say I'm unable to help them, flip this thought around and use the white lens. How was I able to help them thus far? Or how did I help them today? The alternative lens can also help if you ask yourself, would my children or my friends say that I am not able or have never been able to help my children at all. The second statement that you use is never be normal. Now, if you use the white lens, perhaps you can ask yourself instead, 
what can I do to help my child have a meaningful future? And what have I been doing so far to try to ensure a better future for them? It could have been trying to get certain nutritious food for them, trying to get them to go to school or therapy sessions, and even implementing and generalizing, generalizing the strategies that they learned at therapy back home. Now, these might all seem like small, small steps, but if you think about it, the future is actually the next minute and the next day. So what can you do for that next minute and day that will contribute to the future that is further down the road? Taking it one step at a time. So if something comes to mind that you can do to contribute to the future, think about how you can work on that. Doing such things gives you some control rather than just facing a big unknown of what is. And it helps you to find the meaning in right now. Now, please also do reach out to family members or professionals if you feel overwhelmed or if such thoughts and feelings are affecting your functioning. It can be very hard to manage all the demands and our worries on our own. And sometimes we just cannot think of these other perspectives on our own. I hope that helps. Thank you, Elizabeth uh, and Lian for answering Lisan's question. Moving on to the next question, uh, really came about uh, a big theme as well. Parents really struggling to try to manage their emotions, especially when they're juggling the chores, preparing the meals, having to teach their children. Um, Shang-Chi, maybe would you like to take this question about how this parent can actually uh, maybe readjust her teaching methods or manage her emotions better? Yes, sure, Jean. Thanks for the question. You know, I looked at this question. I said, this is a very self-aware mother. She actually was aware her mood is going up and down. And she actually said she wanted to improve her relationship with her kids. So I think this is the very first start because she notices her cup is not very full. And this is a very, very good time to just use what we've taught today. So I think this mommy can do this. Uh, every day when she starts to feel like that, she can ask, how is my heart doing? Okay. If you feel like yelling all the time, something is not right. And you know, the, the studies show that people who are actually very negative mood uh, all the time, right? We start to use very maladaptive ways with our children. Okay. Uh, sometimes we feel like we want to run away. It's not a fight at the flight. The other thing is we start to want to yell or score, or even hit, you know, sometimes spank, smack or spank, right? So I think a distress response will teach a child also how to respond in a similar way when she's upset or when she cannot cope. So one thing is you must find out the trigger. When are these moments you feel like that? Is it always when you're trying to multitask? Can someone quickly take over? Is it an activity that can be occupying your children during the times where you really need to cope for them? The second thing is a lot of parents tell me, I'm very angry. I keep shouting. I want to yell at my kids. So in order not to model that, let's model the positive and the correct behavior. So one mother tells me the only place in the house she can go to calm down herself is actually the bathroom. And children, you know, children, unless they are very small, they go to the public toilet. They, they usually do not go into the bathroom with the mother at home. So the mother closes the door. She takes 10 deep breaths and she has this little sticky tapes around that they say, I need to stop shouting. I will calm down. So she actually made visual reminders of what she needs to do. When she is ready, she will come out and talk to her children calmly. And I tell you, it's not easy to do because, you know, we are all parents. I also yell at my children. So it's a very human thing. But if you're yelling all the time, then you must realize that ah, you need to fill your cup. OK, so I hope that maybe after today's uh, talk, uh, this mommy also has quite a lot of strategies about working through her confidence with her children. And remember also to parent a little bit to the fit uh, of the child's temperament as well as the child's interest and love language. Yeah. Thank you, Shang-Chi, for, for that. And I think the final question tonight uh, is actually a very interesting one because it comes from uh, a service provider. So if we may have question five, um, really about uh, physical exhaustion. This service provider who works at an early intervention center wonders how can she help the parents she works with better? Mm. And it actually sounds like her own bucket might be depleting also, Shang-Chi. So how, what, what advice do you have for her? Yeah. You know what? You know when we talk about the mobile with the family members around, you realize that the caregiving of children 
also happens in school. So actually, a lot of times, you know, two years ago, they did a research among early intervention centers and special needs schools, and they found that the people working in these places are also burning out. That means the food providers. So we are also actually at very high risk of burning out when we work with parents who have very high needs and we are helping them, right? So I think, I hope today's lecture actually gives some strategies for the pro provider herself to practice, you know, the gratitude, how to fill the cup, how to do a bit of positive psychology, mindful, positive emotional habits. This must happen. And I think as a provider, perhaps you are the best person also to teach the mother, to teach the father or to teach the caregiver of the child some of these strategies. So I hope you'll use them on yourself and use them on the parents. The second thing is sometimes in uh, providing care for children in schools, we must also take a break. So there are also caregiving boundaries that we set. Caregiving boundaries doesn't mean that you go and distance ourselves from the parents that you say you don't, uh, you know, we, we, we lack a loof, we act very cold because I know that no providers working in these environments are like that. The, the very fact that they are working in these environments are very loving and passionate providers, okay? But the boundary means that there is also a limit of what you can do and how much you can advise, what you can change, what you cannot change. And you must understand not to bring home some of these yourself. And you will feel very exhausted and very burnt up, right? So there are three things that, you know, I want to share with you guys very quickly on resilience research. You know, they look at people who have undergone natural disasters. And then they look at some of them who are very resilient. And they found that there were a few common things so as a provider, maybe you remind yourself, the first thing is that there is a staunch acceptance of the reality of the situation. So if sometimes you find that some parents are not able to accept, then we have to find a way to say, how can we first work with this parent to accept the things that we cannot change? The second thing is that they say that uh, there is, you know, these people who survive, they have deep belief and strong uh, beliefs that life is very meaningful and their job and role is very meaningful. So despite all these hiccups, this is very important for the provider to remember. Okay, the third thing they notice about these very resilient people is that they have an uncanny ability to quickly adapt and change. And this does not come easy, okay? I would say that it is not so easy to do. But perhaps after today, we have some tools in our toolboxes. Now, we use our white lens, we use a different lens, we try to do a, a little bit of cognitive reframing. And from that, we hope we can help the parents better and help ourselves better. And remember, we are all in a system and we need to work to feed and fill each other's cup. Yeah. That's wonderful. Thank you very, very much, uh, Shanti, for sharing. So um, that concludes the Q&A uh, part of our discussion tonight. And I think uh, just before we end off uh, going to the next slide, so remember that we've created a bunch of resources for you guys. Um, you can print it out again, stick it on your fridge. Um, and we do have a survey that we need your help to fill out. So we'll post those links on our Facebook and you can go answer them uh, at your own time. So uh, maybe just to wrap up very, very quickly, going, on, uh, going around the room, starting with Lian, uh, a word of encouragement for caregivers. Uh, Lian, please. Mm. I think, um, I think parents are really in this very, very uh, meaningful journey and, and to know that um, uh, you've come a long way and there have been many good things that you have done. So please hang in there, uh, take good care of yourself and have some space for self-compassion. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Elizabeth, what about your word of encouragement? Yeah, take moments to reflect daily because that's part of your self-care and it can also lead to more positive interactions with your family members. Mm. Thank you very much. And last but certainly not least, uh, Shang-Chi, a word of encouragement for our caregivers and service providers out there. Yeah, I think I have a very nice phrase that I actually found and I do not know who said this, but it says, if you think my hands are full, wait until you see my heart. Right, And I think this just means that if you think my hands are full, wait until you see how much love how much positivity I can have in my heart, how much strength I can have in my heart. And I just hope that this is the parting message for all parents and providers after what we have shared tonight. And keep going, uh, pandemic or no pandemic, I hope your journey in caregiving will be more fulfilling and also a stronger journey for you. Yeah. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much once again, uh, Leanne, uh, Elizabeth, and Shang-Chi. So um, I think with that, uh, thank you once again for tuning into the Dear Doctor series. Um, we've overrun a little bit, but that's because there's just so much this heart, these hearts in the room I have to share. Uh, and we hope that has certainly been very helpful. Uh, have a good night and get a good rest before the school time.